And so, Lord, I thank you for Mount Sinai. I thank you for Mount Zion, in which your temple was built. Thank you for Mount Moriah, where uh, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, and you provided a lamb. I, I thank you for the mountain that you climbed, Lord Jesus, and preached that sermon. And I thank you for Mount Calvary, the mountain where the New Jerusalem comes down. I thank you, Lord, that that on every mountain you were preaching the same sermon. Jesus, you are that sermon. And so I pray, Lord God, that through the power of your Spirit you'd preach it to our hearts because, Lord, it's just too much for me to, oh, I can't comprehend it, I can't describe it, but, Spirit, you can apply it to our hearts. We ask that you would uh, cause us to preach, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I see. Make sure I have everything here. Drank too much coffee before the service. So you notice I was going out to meditate quite a bit there uh, just a minute ago. I grew up uh, in a pastor's house, um, and and to me, uh, then this uh, pictures like this were everywhere. And I remember this one, I think, or something like it in in particular, because it never seemed. It never seemed too accurate to me. In your Bible, pastor and shepherd are are the the same word. Pastoring looks pretty pleasant in this picture. But a while ago, I saw this video. I came across my desk, and I've just kept it ever since. And, And this video, to me, seems more accurate. Scheiße, fällt hier noch ein und wird von den Schafen überrannt. Scheiße. Das ist der Bock, ne? Ja. Na gut, der Frau. Ach, Scheiße. Hey, 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 hey. Scheiße. I love that. Do you hear that? Scheiße. I'm pretty sure that means something like golly in, in German. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. A, a prophet can refer to someone who foretells events in the future. In the Old Testament, through Moses, God uh, tells the Israelites, quote, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, If the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. That same prophet shall die. My wife has this amazing uh, prophetic gift, and I know several people that do, but I warn them, don't say God says unless you are entirely sure that God actually says. Otherwise, you may be taking God's name in vain destroying people's wives, lives and, and doing the work of, of the evil one. Don't think we have to kill you, but don't do it. Don't do it. So if you've heard someone say something like, God said the rapture will happen in 2019, and you notice that it did not happen, do not fear them. And seriously, you need to seriously not listen to them anymore. Jesus says, beware. It's a command. Beware of false prophets. But now prophecy isn't simply foretelling, uh, foretelling so much as foretelling, telling the truth about things. Revelation 19, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That can mean that when you testify of Jesus, you're actually prophesying through the power of the Holy Spirit, or that when you prophesy, Jesus is actually testifying through you, through the power of of his spirit, and I think it means both. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, earnestly desire that you would prophesy. But at the same time, we're to beware of false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep, talk like sheep, act like sheep, walk like sheep, but they devour other people. 
They devour others' lives like, like wolves. Growing up in church, as a kid, I watched uh, people talk like sheep and then bite my father like a wolf. But I think I was most surprised in 1982 when I watched some of his fellow shepherds turn and devour him like a wolf. If for no other reason, in my mind, I mean, this is what it was, dad had started bleeding like Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the great shepherd, and every pastor is also a sheep or a a wolf in sheep's clothing. Wolves are carnivorous. They eat sheep and shepherds. (laughs) and sometimes their own kind. Paul Harvey used to tell how Eskimos would, would kill wolves. A hunter would take a knife and put frozen blood on the blade, plant it on a pole in the snow, and then a wolf would come and begin licking the knife during the night, not noticing that it was cutting its tongue, and in this way it would devour itself, consume its own life. The life is in the blood. As a young pastor in California, I worked at two megachurches pastored by shepherds known for books and sermons on integrity and the family. Around the same time, it was discovered that both of them have participated in numerous adulterous relationships and been continually lying to the congregation about those relationships. It wasn't the affairs that really hurt me so much, but how they lied their way through the whole process talking like sheep and still devouring like wolves, devouring both women in the church and the heart in my own chest. As I told you a few weeks ago, the same thing that happened to my father happened to me. I won't go into details, and I really can't go into details, but suffice it to say that I was shocked and appalled at how some who had acted like sheep turned and devoured my life, my psyche, like wolves. You know, it's no wonder that werewolves are so prevalent in our pop culture, just like zombies and vampires. They're creatures that look human, but inside lust for body broken and bloodshed. They consume the good in order to be the best. They devour the life in order to live, but everything dies. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, says Jesus. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy or good tree bears good or or beautiful fruit, but the disease, the, the corrupt, the rotten tree bears evil fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Now I should probably mention that good fruit in Scripture is not what most people think of as good fruit in our, in our culture. It's not, it's not power and possessions. In fact, the first person said to do the beautiful thing, the kalos ergon, the, the beautiful f- fruit, In the Gospel of Matthew is this prostitute, you remember, who dumps an entire year's worth of perfumed oil over the head of Jesus the week before he is crucified. In Galatians 5, Paul describes good fruit and, and bad fruit. But he doesn't really call the bad a fruit. He calls it a a a work, not something living, but but dead, like fruit that's been picked or fruit on a tree that's, that's dying and is now rotten or, or rotting. Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, that's what wolves do, right? If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I think it's important to point out that the problem with the flesh, my flesh, is not that it's physical, but that it only feels its own pain and its own pleasure. It's cut off from the flesh of others. But the spirit of love weeps with those who weep and rejoices with those who rejoice. I mean, love feels the pain of each, right, and the pleasure 
of all. That's what pleasure is, when all are in harmony. Feels the, the pain of each, pleasure of all, as if my neighbor were actually myself. When a wolf eats a sheep, it feels its own pleasure, but not the pain of the sheep. It literally makes the sheep its own self, its own flesh, its own body. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, your your own individual body. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the life, the breath that's in the blood that circulates through a much larger body. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you would do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, uncontrolled desire, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, that's competitions, dissensions, divisions, factionalism, like going full-on Democrat or full-on Republican, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, literally he just says faith, gentleness, self-control or control of self. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So you will recognize them by their fruits, says Jesus. So this is pretty simple. If you've ever loved someone, you're not a wolf. And if you've ever been jealous or competitive, you are a wolf. If you've ever desired to beat your neighbor rather than love your neighbor, well, you're a wolf. In John 2, we read that Jesus didn't entrust himself to people because, quote, he knew what was in all people. He himself knew what was in man. Sounds like the great shepherd could smell a wolf. John 10, Jesus says, all who came before me, that would include like Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, all the prophets, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the good shepherd. Jesus saying every prophet until now was a false prophet who did not love the sheep or lay their life down for the sheep, but used the sheep to build their own ego. That's a wolf. Acts 20, Paul describes wolves as those that speak in order to draw followers, quote, followers after themselves, which I think pretty much describes every pastor I know, including me. Jesus just told us, the judgment you pronounce is the judgment you receive. So maybe I'm so aware of wolves because I am one. I mean, the more I compete with others, the more I I do notice them competing with with me. Maybe I was shocked when the wolves turned on me, not because they were wolves, but because, you know, they were just so bad at hiding that fact in sheep's clothing. You do realize that we define ourselves as winners by defining other people as losers. We think we're first by considering others to be last. I feel better about my own sermons when other sermons suck. I think I'm more righteous when I discover that my neighbor has sinned. It's tempting to think I'm saved just because others are damned, and that's pretty damned evil if you stop to think about it. I feed my psyche with the failures of others. I'm a carnivore. A carnivore, and so are you, whether you eat meat or not. We're all werewolves, zombies, and vampires. We're the monsters of which we are most terrified. You do realize that your own individual and isolated flesh, your, your body of flesh, it literally eats the flesh of others, eats their lives. You know what we call it? Food. Plant or animal. We eat life and excrete death. In order to live our lives, we eat life and excrete death. We call it shaitsa. I'm just saying that your sin may be far greater than you ever imagined. 
I think Jesus is breaking it to you, breaking it to us, breaking it to us slowly that, well, we're, we're each like a wolf and we can't fix it. You know the law, that's the knowledge of good and evil, it can only teach wolves how to act like sheep. It can never turn a wolf into a sheep or anything else. Verse 16, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So maybe you've recognized this fact. You've got a wolf in you. And yet, if you've got any love, joy, peace, patience in you, well, there's something other than a wolf in you. Or even a sheep in you, because good fruit isn't called the fruit of the sheep, right? (laughs) It's called the fruit of something else. Whatever the case, each of us is divided between good and evil. And if you project that division upon others, you, you, well, you end up labeling some good as some others. If you, don't, uh, if, if, if you don't recognize the division in yourself, you will project it on others. And these people will be good, these people will be bad, and we'll even project the division on God, describing him as, as love and then the very opposite of love. Or, or maybe the, the good God, the Savior Jesus, and the terrifying God, the bad God, you know, the big God, God the Father. But God is not two. God is one. Each of us is two. Well, Jesus makes a contrast between two trees as if you have two trees in the garden of your own heart, and one tree explains the wolf, and the other explains something like a sheep, but, but more than a sheep, something that can prophesy. Two trees, or maybe it's one tree, because he goes on to describe a, a corrupt tree. Like, that's like a healthy tree, but that's either dead or, or dying, so all of its fruit has gone bad. Matthew 12, G- Jesus says something really weird about a tree. Make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You know, the Bible says all kinds of crazy things about tree, trees, more crazy things than you know. Uh, for in Hebrew, there's one word that can be translated as tree, timber, or wood. That Hebrew word is eights. So Noah is saved in an ark made of eights. Isaac is prepared for sacrifice on a bundle of eights on Mount Moriah, also known as Mount Calvary or Mount Zion. The law, knowledge of good and evil in in stone, the law on stone, in stone, is placed in an ark or coffin made of eights, and then the Lord God, who is the good and the life, would manifest on top of that coffin between two cherubim, like those that guarded the way to the eights of life in the middle of the Garden of Eden. In Greek, there's this word that translates eights, the word skulon, that can also be translated tree, timber, or, or cross. Jesus was crucified on a skulon in a garden, according to John 19, a garden on Mount Calvary. The skulon of life stands in the middle of the new Jerusalem, uh, garden city of Jerusalem on, on Mount Zion. The new Jerusalem is the temple of God, and so are you. In Scripture, trees can be men, like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember this? As well as their kingdoms, like Babylon. Israel is also a tree. In Isaiah 6, God appears to Isaiah above the ark and tells him to chop Israel down with his prophetic word. Chop her down to a stump. And then he says this. The holy seed is its stump. That's Jesus, the holy seed, the root of Jesse. You remember that just before he was crucified, Jesus cursed a fig tree on Mount Zion. See, maybe that's about more than grumpy Jesus missing his breakfast. 
In Luke, he tells about a tree that won't grow fruit, and the master wants to cut it down, but the gardener says, no, just, just throw some shaitza on it and come back later. So a tree is like a man and a kingdom and a system of thought. A kingdom is the dominion of the king's judgments or commandments. I know that the Father's commandment is eternal life, said Jesus, and we know that Jesus is the commandment of God and the life. A tree is a, is a system. A tree is a system of living cells that, that absorbs light through its leaves and mixes that life with shaitza, dirt and decay, dirt and decay from the earth producing fruit. And in that fruit, seed, which results in more trees. I mean, a tree is a miracle called grace. But of course, you can also hang a man on a tree. You can take the life of a man on a tree. And cursed is the man that hangs on a tree and eats a school on, that is, a dead tree. Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit beautiful, good, or, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Now most would say this simply means that we can recognize a tree by its fruit, but Jesus didn't say a tree. He says the tree. And he doesn't simply say recognize the tree, but, but make the tree. And, and now you all know that history begins with this weird, weird story about a really strange tree in the middle of a garden, Genesis 2-9, and out of the ground, Adama in Hebrew, out of the Adama, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst, or the middle, the middle, in the middle of the garden, and, or that is, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil, the, the Hebrew word vav, translated and, can be what scholars call a vav explicativum. <laughs> that's a fancy way of saying that and can be translated as that is. And that's also the way we often use and in English. I am Peter Hyatt and Mr. Wonderful. I'm not saying there are two of me. I'm saying that there are two names for one of me, or at least two names in my own mind. There are several other reasons for thinking that Genesis 2.9 describes one tree, including the fact that Genesis goes on to speak of the tree in the middle of the garden, not two trees in the middle of the garden, as well as the fact that wisdom is a tree of life, according to Solomon, which provides him with knowledge of good and evil, as well as the fact that Jesus is wisdom and Jesus is the life. Jesus is the knowledge of good, which is the will of God, and so taking his life would certainly give you the knowledge of evil, and besides all this, there's one tree in the middle of the garden city of the New Jerusalem. There are lots of reasons to think the two trees are one tree, except for this one apparent glaringly contradictory reason, and that is that one tree appears to kill, and the other tree appears to make alive. One tree seems to bear evil fruit, like dead bodies, and the other tree bears good. So was it one tree or two? Well, how about this tree in the midst of another garden that happens to be in the very same place where Isaac was to be sacrificed? The ark was kept in the temple. The new Jerusalem comes down on Mount Zion. What do you know of this tree. It's one tree. Is it good or evil? Does it take life or make alive? Is this tree evil? Well, well the tree itself isn't, isn't evil. I mean, like the famous poem and like Genesis reveals, only God can make a tree. Maybe we can kill a tree or corrupt a tree, but only God can make a tree. So the tree may not be evil, and yet at this tree we do, we do learn about evil, don't we? 
What happened at this tree is the very definition of evil. Think about it. What could possibly more be more evil than the children of Adam taking the life of love, who is our Lord, on, on a tree? Taking it like you might take an apple because you thought it was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. You know, like a bit of knowledge from a book or from a law that you could apply to yourself and make yourself better than your neighbor. What could possibly more be, be more evil than what we did when we took the body and blood like a wolf? We ate the life like one of the walking dead and drank the blood like a vampire. What could be more evil than what happened at this tree? And what could possibly be more good, <laughs> better than what happened at this tree? Do we learn what the good is at this tree? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Do we receive life at this tree? <laughs> yes! We die with him and we, we rise with him forever at this tree. But, but did God command us to take the life of this good man on this tree? Or did he command us to not take the life of the good man on the... Well, he told us not to murder, right? For a few thousand years, he said, do not murder. But didn't this happen according to God's plan? Yes! This is the very point of God's plan. The lamb that's slain from the foundation of the world. What could possibly be a greater good than the moment in which our Creator, who is love, forgave every sin and gave each of us his own life? You see, from our perspective, this appears to be the worst of all trees, the place we take the life of the good and we damn ourselves and all things with us. And yet, from the perspective of eternity, this appears to be the very best of all trees, the place God gives us himself and all things with him, the, the place we were born, born out of this age into eternity, our home. This tree is the judgment of God. If we view this as simply our judgment, it's absolute evil and everything dies. For like ravenous wolves, we just ate the life and made ourselves evil. But if we see that our judgment is encased in God's judgment, like the law was placed in the ark under the mercy seat, then we see that our decision to sin is encased in God's decision to save and to sanctify and to create. We see that the story of our sin is a part of God's eternal story of grace. we see God's judgment, eternal, irrefutable, and the foundation of all things. We see God's judgment, and so our judgment, the wolf dies. The wolf dies, and something else begins to rise within the tomb that is ourselves, our old selves, our, our wolf selves. One judgment is death and evil, but God's judgment, our judgment is death and evil, but God's judgment is life and endless grace, the meaning of all things, all things, all things. So the way you judge this tree is literally the way you judge everything else. What you make of this tree and what this tree makes of you is literally reality. Because what is it that's hanging on the tree? The way. The truth. The life. The good in human flesh. The judgment of God. The righteousness of God. The righteousness that, that is God. I am in human flesh, <laughs> existence, beingness, hangs on that tree. 
So I want you to look at the fruit on this tree, not at me, while I just ask you a few questions, okay? And then you can look back at me when I tell you to stop. But I want you to just look at the fruit, look at the fruit on the tree, and let me ask you these questions. Is the way something that you can comprehend and control, like, you know, a map that you then put in your pocket? Or is the way someone, someone that you are to follow like a sheep follows a, a shepherd? Is the truth a thing that you can well, that you can use or perhaps even twist into a lie. What would that look like? Is that what the truth is or is the truth someone for whom you're willing to die and sacrifice everything? Is, is the life your own? In other words, would you take the body and blood to assimilate that life into your own life like a wolf eats a, a sheep or even a shepherd? Is it your life or is it the life? which means it is not simply a part of you, but you and every living thing are actually a part of it or a part of him, him who gives himself to you. Not like food that, that dies in you, but food that comes to life in you and that rises with, within you. Is the good something you can know and use to justify yourself like a law in a book? Or is the good someone that knows you? Perhaps even like a husband knows his, his bride and well, she produces fruit, she bears fruit. Is the word something that you can speak as you see fit? Or is the word someone who has spoken you and all things into existence? Someone living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joined in marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, perhaps even giving you his own heart. Is love something you make? Or is love someone that's making you all the time? Would you judge the fruit on this tree? Or is the fruit on this tree judging you? You see, this is God's judgment, his decision, his, his free will, his righteousness. So is righteousness a decision you make? Or is righteousness a decision God's make, God makes, a decision he makes and plants in you and, and, is, and is making even within you, uh, that is making you into who it is that you truly are? Is righteousness simply a score in some book that God keeps in a closet somewhere? Or is righteousness a decision that God makes in that he makes sitting on the throne in, in the temple that is your heart, your, your, your life, that is you. Now, look at me after you ponder those questions a bit. I had experience earlier this year that I expect most of you will find hard to believe. And yet I can't not believe because it really happened. Susan and I were praying for a dear friend with whom we've prayed for many times before that I've known now for about 25 years, like a handful of other people that we've prayed for. She knows and loves Jesus, but she's also really suffered from some trauma in her past, and so at times she wrestles with evil spirits in rather dramatic ways. I began praying with a few people like this years ago when they were unable to find help in other places, and I figured, well, shoot, this would really look good on my spiritual resume. <laughs> Could see I'm kind of a wolf. But time and time again, I'd find myself in these terrifying situations, entirely, entirely over my head, reduced to desperately crying out for Jesus like a sheep looks for its shepherd. Well, a few months ago, toward the end of this truly outrageous episode or time of, of prayer, I, well, I just began praying in tongues because I honestly didn't know what else to do and nothing seemed to be working. It's something that I began to do as a kid in my friend Ricky's room when the charismatic movement blew through town in the early 70s. And to be honest with you, for years I found it rather embarrassing. I mean, I always wanted something cool like to prophesy or 
or to turn water into wine, but tongues just seemed kind of silly. But, but I did it, hoping that maybe actually it would sort of mean something. Well, this night a few months ago, I was praying in tongues. And all hell was breaking loose. I, I was praying in tongues, and after a time, my, my friend um, well, began to answer me in, in tongues, even as a, a little girl began to answer me in tongues. And after more time, she began answering me in English, or I should say arguing with me in English, or I should really say arguing with Jesus in me in English. So I'd say something in tongues, and she'd say something like this. I remember her saying this, but, but why did you leave me? You always leave. And I'd answer her in tongues. And she'd say something like, but then what do I do? How will I, how will I know? And I'd answer in tongues. At one point she said this, pray? What do you mean pray? I'm talking to you right now. And I'd answer in tongues, thinking, God, I have no idea what I'm saying. At another point, something evil manifested, and mockingly said, you don't even know what you're saying. And I laughed and said, yeah, I I don't know what I'm saying, and kept praying in tongues. At another point, my friend came back around and also laughed and said, you don't even know what you're saying, and, and I didn't know what I was saying. All I knew was that I loved her, and that I was so happy that Jesus was speaking to her. Well, the next day, she sent me an email with some of what she remembered that Jesus had said to her through my mouth. And she gave me permission to read it to you uh, this morning. I, I'll read most of it. This is what she said Jesus said through me. I know what you felt and felt it with you. You know my heart. You're a part of mine and I am a part of yours. I live and breathe in you and through you. You're hiding me from people who need me by staying in the dark. You keep your lips tight, afraid of being too much or annoying. I want to hear your heart, and I want you to see things through me. I understand. I am with you always. I was there always. My love is a part of you. It's what loves your kids and loves people when you don't even know them. You let it beam with strangers. You see and feel others' pain. It is a gift that I've given you, but you run from it. Come sit with me every day. Come and sit with me. Come be with me and see you as I see and as I know you. You are not bad. You feel broken, but I can heal you. I am strong for you, and if you will let go, you will grow to be strong and not walk away from me and my heart. I am with everyone, and it does not keep me from being with you. Everyone is my one. You don't need to understand. Just sit with me every day. Every day, share with me and listen and look from my heart in you and around you. Isn't that beautiful? Everyone is my one. I didn't write that. <laughs> That's the great shepherd. You see, I, Peter Hyatt, insecure, self centered, often quite wolf like, I prophesied. Those weren't my words. That was God's word. That was Jesus. That was the lamb that was slain. That was the sheep in the wolf in sheep's clothing. The sheep, but not simply a sheep. To be more precise, that was the shepherd in the wolf in sheep's clothing. Shepherding one of his sheep. How did the shepherd get in there? talk about that in a minute, but this is what I earnestly want you to hear and, and get right now, okay? So listen closely. I was utterly amazed that Jesus was talking through me because I was me. 
remember I kept thinking, I hope I don't screw this up. I hope I don't think a bad thought. And then I thought a bad thought. And then he was still talking. I was like, wow, amazing. I was utterly amazed that Jesus was speaking through me, for I was still so obviously me. Confused, insecure, little old, old me. I, I remember thinking, when, when she told me all of this, I remember thinking, that was so entirely unusual. And then I thought, no. Maybe that was so entirely usual. That's the thought that I've been chewing on now for six months, and I desperately want you to get. Maybe any time you tell someone about Jesus, not because you have to, but because you want to, you're prophesying. Maybe any time you say something kind to someone, something loving, something good, well, it's not simply you that's speaking. I mean, yeah, your lips are moving, your brain is working, but it's not your words, it's not your thoughts. Maybe love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, control of yourself is not simply yourself. Maybe you could call it your fruit, but not because you chose it or chose him, but because he chose you and chose to manifest his life and you grow his fruit on you even for the good of your neighbor. Maybe all righteousness is his righteousness. Imputed to you. Given to you. All of it. But now, what would that mean if you began to feel proud or boast, I mean ever so slightly, or felt that you deserved a little credit for that righteousness? What if you began to feel a little self-righteous and so began to compete with your neighbor and so envy your neighbor's righteousness, maybe even jealous of Jesus in your neighbor? What if you picked the fruit in yourself or your neighbor? What if you picked the fruit and you took the fruit as if it were your own? I think it would mean that you would have just crucified our Lord to feed your own flesh. And all the fruit would begin to rot and you'd smell a wolf. Matthew seven twenty. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit, rotten fruit. Works of the flesh, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. When you smell a wolf, it could be the wolf in you or it could be the wolf in your neighbor. It's probably both because the judgment we pronounce is the judgment we receive. I mean, wolves inspire other wolves. Well, well when that happens, you can't just fix things by trying because it's all you're trying to fix things that turned you into a wolf in the first place. You have to return to the tree. Stop judging God's judgment and let God's judgment judge you. Because who is it that's hanging on the tree? The good shepherd. So he took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When we come to this table, we confess our sin we expose the wolf to the judgment of God. We surrender the life we stole and our stolen knowledge of good and evil. In other words, we surrender all our judgments to God's judgment. We expose it to the fire. We confess our sin and we ingest God's mercy. We confess our bad judgment and we receive God's Good judgment. How did the good shepherd get into the wolf in sheep's clothing? The shepherd said, take and eat my body given to you. Take and drink 
my blood poured out for you. You see, there's, there's seed in the fruit. Even in stolen fruit, there's seed. And check this out. He forgave you the fruit long before you ever took the fruit. What you take has always been given. You cannot take it like a wolf if you receive it like a sheep from your shepherd. And he knows that you're not really a wolf. It turns out that your false self is the product of your own bad judgment, which means it's this temporary illusion in which you are trapped, but you are trapped nonetheless in this temporary illusion. But you're not a wolf, and you're not really even a sheep. Sheep just follow shepherds rather than eat shepherds. It turns out that you're not just a sheep, but you're the very body of the great shepherd. And you know, a body constantly feeds itself. Each member bleeds life into the next member, and none of the members die. Every member is happy. That decision to bleed for your neighbor, to feed your neighbor, is called love. And it's not simply your decision. It's the judgment of God, and it's given to you at a tree in a garden. So the good shepherd says to you, take and eat. Take and drink. And would you believe that what you have taken, I have forgiven from the foundation of the world? That's the gospel. In Jesus' name, believe. Amen. And so you see, the cross is not the story of how the bad God beats up on the good God in order to feel better about you so that if you have enough knowledge of good and evil, you, he just might not torture you. The story of the cross, the story of the tree, is the same story he's been telling all along. It's the story of how at the end of the sixth day, God makes you in his own image by giving you his own heart, Jesus from the bosom of the Father, in order that you and all the rest of Ha'adam, humanity, would come together and with one breath, with one voice, would, would praise your, your Father, your lover, your creator. That's the gospel. Make the tree good. And the fruit will be beautiful. Amen? Sorry, I got into that because well, I really care about that. I mean, I really think that we need a reformation. And uh, I say that just because I know the sermon gets a little theological at points, but that's because I think we've been messing up the story. And, and I want people to believe the story. And in the sermon notes, uh, 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 well, the, the transcripts, they'll be online. I'll have a bunch of end notes and footnotes. It, this week, there's a bunch of them, and I think they're pretty good so that the sermon, so the sermon wouldn't be three hours long. But, but it's also to help you to kind of process this because, you see, everything I preach is simply just saying you can trust God because <laughs> he's good. So anyway, if you want to go online and read that, 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 would, that would be great, but all I'm saying is believe the gospel, and if you would like a prayer, uh, Ted's down front here, and he would, uh, he would be glad to pray with you. Have a wonderful week. See you next week.